Well, here we are again, about to wrap up another week, and I hope it was a good one for you. Some of you students have been saying that you get more sleep uh, in these circumstances, in this distance learning situation. Well, I hope that means you're getting more sleep in the night's rest and not more sleep during the videos that you're watching. Whatever the case, let's talk to God for just a few moments. Dear Father, we thank you for another day, and we thank you for life itself. We realize that you are the giver of all good things. We thank you that you have given us the air to breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, and that all these good things come from your mighty and merciful hand. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you're able to read the poems of Walt Whitman. As you probably discovered, they were quite a bit different from the poems of Longfellow and Whittier and Dickinson. We're going to be looking in the textbook at some of these, and so if you got your textbook, you might want to follow along. In section one of Song of Myself, Whitman boldly asserts that he's going to let his voice be heard. He's a 37-year-old red-blooded American and is ready to set forth his views, both positive and negative, with an original energy. His opening lines are rather striking. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. So that's kind of an interesting way to start out by saying you're going to assume what I assume, and we all have atoms that we share in common. In the next section, number 21, he underscores again that he's going to tell both the goods and the bads. And then he states that he's writing for women as well as for men. Whitman then reasserts that he's going to be realistic and he has as much right to speak as anybody. He will share what he has learned during his walks. Now notice how he says, I am he that walks with a tender and growing night. I call to the earth and see half held by night. And so during those times of meditation, it looks like now he wants to share some of the things that he's been thinking. In section 31, Whitman admits that he's astounded by various aspects of nature, a leaf of grass, the planet's orbit, a grain of sand, the wren's egg, his own hand, the cow, and the mouse. These things have more miracle in them than what we might expect if we really stop and think about them. Uh, this is not so much the transcendentalist saying, let's stop and look at nature and see what lessons we can learn. Rather, I think Whitman is just rather astounded by the creation and so many different things in the creation. And so he says, if we were really just stop and contemplate, for example, our own hand, uh, look at the marvel of the hand, look at its complexity, look at its purposes, look at its function, and all of those things uh, kind of reveal uh, something of a miracle if we really stop and think about it. In 52, Whitman describes himself as a bit untamed. He may have some rough edges, but he is growing and will speak his mind. You may not agree with him, but keep listening to see if you can understand him. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. So continue to, to give him a chance and to listen to him. Well now, what would you say is the tone of Song of Myself. Well, I believe I heard Judah say bold. And wasn't that uh, Ashlyn who said confident? And maybe that was Celeste who said sassy? And maybe Sky egotistical? <laughs> yeah, maybe all of those. But you see, it's not quite the same as what these other poets that we've been reading. Um, a little more in your face, maybe we could say even, is the poet Walt Whitman than the previous poets that we've been looking at. The next poem is, I Heard America Singing. And here Whitman says that he hears all kinds of American singing. Uh, mechanics, carpenters, masons, boatmen, uh, shoemakers, woodcutters, plowboys, um, hatters, um, mothers, wives, girls. All of these different occupations and groups are there singing and some are even singing very strongly. So why do you think he may have written 
this poem? Well, perhaps it's to show how vital and alive Americans were back in the 1850s. You know, people usually sing when they're happy or when they're um, elated about something. And so we see the strength, we see the, the, uh, the energy that's being produced by these different peoples at their jobs, at their, in their lives, uh, where everyone is singing his or her own song. And then all can rejoice in the songs of others as well as they live in this free nation. In the next poem, we hear about a person who goes to hear a lecture on astronomy. And the speaker, who is a learned astronomer, uh, got much applause from others, but he didn't do too much for the poet, who actually got rather bored. So the poet leaves the lecture hall, goes out into the night, looks up at the stars in the sky, and is suddenly awestruck. Well, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? The fact that we can learn from many different sources. Sometimes we learn from teachers and books, but sometimes we learn from our own experiences as we go through nature and as we go through life. Have you ever had a similar experience to the one that he had? Or maybe you were trying to learn something one way, but ended up learning it another? Well, if that's the case, please share that with us in our next Zoom meeting. With beep beat drums, we now find the Civil War has begun. As the textbook noted, most people in the North thought this war was going to end quickly, but some bloody battles soon showed that this conflict was going to be a long and brutal affair. Whitman states that this war is going to affect all, the homes, the churches, the scholars, those who just married, and the farmer. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. In fact, there's almost a refrain throughout the poem that things aren't going to improve. So fierce your whirr and pound you drums, so shrill you bugles blow. And so here they're intensifying even the more so. And the sounds of war will drown out all other sounds, traffic, bargain hunters, talkers, singers, lawyers, judges. The drums will rattle quicker and the bugles will blow wilder, which is indicating again how the war will continue to intensify. And then he highlights how the war will overshadow all, all reasoning, all praying, all pleading of fathers for their sons not to join the ranks, all playing of children, all begging of mothers, all laying of the corpses by the hearses. War is going to disturb everyone. So strong you thump, O oh, terrible drums, so loud you bugles blow. And there's that refrain again about the drums and the bugles and how it's, it's continuing to intensify. Well, we asked the question, how does this free verse help contribute to the intensity of this poem? And I think you can see very easily that a type of rhythm pattern <clears throat> would probably take away or reduce some of the poem's vitality. Whitman's encouragement for the drums and the bugles to beat and to blow even louder comes across more naturally because it's not limited by any fixed syllable pattern. In the poem Rec Reconciliation, Whitman states that all the horrors of war are utterly forgotten with time. Is that really true? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. We may forget that a particular field was once a battlefield, but the results of the battle may still be in effect generations later. Then Whitman states that death and night are like women who wash away the soil of the world again and again. Very interesting imagery. Then he sees a dead body of a rebel soldier, someone who, described, who he describes as being as divine as himself. For even though this man was an enemy, he still had a soul as well. And he then bends over and kisses the dead man's pale face. With that gesture, Whitman tries to show that the dead enemy is still loved and accepted. And isn't that what reconciliation is all about. What did you sense after you read this poem? Yeah, Noah, maybe sorrow. 
right, Rebecca? Maybe serenity. Yeah, Bailey? Maybe a ray of hope. This little poem really tugs at all our emotions, doesn't it? So I think you can see that Whitman's poetry is very different, but you can also see that this free verse is very powerful and moving. And I like, and I, and I look forward to hearing which poem you like the best out of these five. Also, what contrast do you see between Dickinson's poems, for example, and Whitman's poems? I'm sure you can see there are some very uh, stark contrasts. So please share those with me as well. Well, now we come in our textbook to what are called Negro spirituals, those tremendously moving songs that arose out of the horrors of slavery. What a conviction and determination they portray. In fact, your textbook says spirituals were an important expression of the slave life in the South. Although they may have been inspired originally by the religious revivals that slaves attended with their masters, spirituals became a form of poetry for black people, reflecting their language, music, and their special concerns. And so we're going to take a, a little bit of time to, to look at these Negro spirituals. You know, the slaves' bodies may have been beaten down, but the wicked masters could not defeat their souls. As you listen, to these songs, be thinking about these questions. What do they all have in common? What messages do they communicate? How were those messages shaped? And what is moving about the music? And in that regard, be sure to look at the video where Phelps gives you some interesting insight into the music of the spirituals. Now we're going to look at the two spirituals that are in our textbook, Go Down Moses and Swing Low Sweet Chariot, to, to kind of answer some of these questions to get you on the, on the track there. The first spiritual is taken from the biblical story of the Exodus. The book of Genesis informs us that after Joseph's death, the ruler of Egypt, known as the Pharaoh, became fearful of the Jews, so he turned them into his slaves and cruel taskmasters beat them to force them to work. The Afro-American slave sees a parallel here with their forced labor. God then sent Moses to Egypt to tell the Pharaoh to liberate the Jews. And after 10 devastating plagues, Pharaoh finally tells the Jews to leave and gives them their freedom. He still later pursues them, but at least he gives them their freedom to let them go. In the same way, the Afro-American slaves wanted someone to be their Moses and to help them to experience freedom. Did they get their wish? Yes. Eventually, Abraham Lincoln becomes their Moses as he challenged the Confederate states to let their slaves now have their freedom. The next spiritual, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, also comes from another biblical story. It involves two prophets, Elijah, Elijah and Elisha. Now Elisha was an apprentice to Elijah, and Elijah knew that soon God was going to take his life. When these two men got to the Jordan River, Elijah asked Elisha what he could give him, and Elisha said that he wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elijah responded that his request was difficult, but if he saw Elijah's end, then the request would be granted. Soon after that statement, God sent a chariot of fire which picked up Elijah and carried him up into heaven. And as he was ascending skyward, he cast down his mantle. After Elisha could see him no more, he picked up Elijah's mantle, and now Elisha had become the new prophet in Israel. His request had been granted and he would no longer be an apprentice. Now notice how this story is applied to the slave situation. They looked over Jordan, but here not a literal river, but a symbol of death. And they had faith that the angels would come and carry them to paradise. They said to let the other saints in heaven know that they would soon be making this trip to join them. Just like Elijah, God would send another chariot to carry them home as well. Not only 
is this message beautiful? But the melody is moving as well. Now I've added several more of these spirituals in Google Classrooms, which looks like a whole lot, but it really won't take you that long to listen to them and to read through the words. The um, words have been put on slides so that if you wanna look at the words before they sing or after they sing, whichever way suits you better. And then the songs themselves are only usually about two to three minutes long. So it's not gonna probably take you over 20 to 25 minutes to get through the whole, the whole shebang. Be sure on soon one morning to move the slider up to 1030. There's a group singing several other songs uh, on that particular track. So move it on up to 1030 in order to hear this, just this one particular song. And the song starts that way, soon one morning. So if you hear those words, then you'll know you're in the right spot. I hope you'll enjoy listening to these songs and considering their message as well. All right, I hope this lesson wasn't too painful and that you learned a little something to boot. You're a great audience and I thank you for continuing to expand your minds and better yourself during these tough times. I'm glad that you've decided, as our generation puts it, to keep on keeping on. Until our next class, may God bless you and may he protect you.